Yo, I'm here to say, and finals are finally done, and we made it to the Megami Tensei Marathon. At the time of this video's release, SMT5 has basically been out for a month, and for fans getting into the franchise, I wanted to go through most of the mainline SMT games. So this franchise is pretty much interesting in a lot of ways, not just in the gameplay and music, but also in the art and the environment, which basically kind of makes you a little uneasy, a little bit. But anyway, for this marathon, something I am going to regret, but I am going to be reviewing all of the mainline games, besides 9. Um, until that gets a fan translation, I am not touching that with a 10 inch pole. Now, the main goal for this um, marathon slash retrospect is to pretty much see the evolution of Megami Tensei, look at the good, the bad, and see how it all evolved into SMT5. But let's not waste any more time and let's start from the very beginning on the Famicom. On September 11th, 1987, Digital Devil Story on Megami Tensei was released in Japan for the Famicom. And by the way, this is going to be the case for like half of the older games, besides one game that we'll talk about later. These games were not localized in the US for understandable reasons. The game focuses on Nakajima and Yumiko having to stop Lucifer from taking over the world as well as saving Izanami. The game was a critical and financial success, with many praising the game's unusual setting and gameplay. Yet, a major criticism for this game was its dungeon design, which made it very easy for people to get lost. Now, for this game and the next game we'll be reviewing, I'm going to be focusing on the remastered version of these games known as Kuyaku Megami Tensei. This was a remaster of the Famicom games and released in 1995 for the Super Famicom and was developed by Opera House, who was known for critically acclaimed games such as Super Hockey 94 and Master of Magic. This game is a full remaster of the original Famicom games with the graphics and gameplay resembling SMT1 and SMT2. Now, I'm going to be playing these games both out of convenience and the fact that these versions are easier than the original game, but they are available through a fan translation if you want to try the Famicom version out. But let's not waste any more time and let's start with this game's very short story. Prior to the events of the game, we have Akemi Nakajima, an intelligent high school student who creates a demon summoning program to fight back against his bullies. It ends up backfiring with Loki and Set attempting to bring demons to the real world. After being saved by transfer student Yumiko Shirasaki, they join forces and defeat Loki and Set. From here, the game introduces us to the main antagonist, Lucifer, who wants to invade the world with demons, and in order to do so, he kidnaps Izanami, resurrects Loki and Set, and constructs a massive labyrinth. Nakajima and Yumiko learns of this and sets out on the adventure to save Izanami and defeat Lucifer. Well, that was short. I don't know why I was expecting from a Famicom game, but yeah, that was, that was very short. However, the progression itself is more like a story, just from getting from point A to point B, and the hell that you have to endure with that. But before we go and talk about that hellhole, let's cover the gameplay for us, which is surprisingly a lot. On the surface, Digital Devil Story seems like your average JRPG. You traverse from one area to another, have random encounters, can fight enemies or just run, and after beating them you get XP and money. However, this game has some key differences from other JRPGs of the Famicom. The first difference is that Nakajima can't use magic and Yumiko can't, which if you're used to playing other JRPGs like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest, this will be very, very different to what you're used to. And from here, you can also adjust the character's stats. There's overall 5 stats that each have their own usage. Vitality affects the amount of health you have, and I think defense as well, don't quote me on that. Intellect affects your overall magic power and the amount of MP you get. Strength affects your physical power, speed determines who goes first, and the effectiveness of leaving battles. And luck, which the more you have, the higher chance for you to get a critical hit. But the biggest difference is what this game is known for, Demon Negotiation. Before fighting an enemy, you can choose to talk option to negotiate with demons. You have different options, but the two main ones you'll do is either offer a gift or threaten it like it owes you money. Negotiations will often feel like trial and error for different reasons, as some demons cannot be negotiated with, and you may think you can negotiate with a demon only to fuck around and get your ass dropped by a tree or a damn genie. Plus, demons that are jockeys are impossible to recruit, as they love to give you status ailments. Fuck jockeys. One of the biggest keys to negotiate with demons is the moon phase, which from the new moon to the full moon, demons are harder to reason with, and vice versa. You can summon demons into your party after recruiting them, which is especially needed in the later portions of the game, and you can have up to 4 demons in the party as overall, it's just Nakajima and Yumiko. Summoning demons requires money for some bizarre fucking reason that I've refused to ponder about, and once summoned, they run on magnetite, which can be collected from treasure chests or defeating enemies, and if you run out of it, the demons you have in your party will start to take damage. 
Here's the thing though, you can only recruit 7 demons which will lead you to the Cathedral of Shadows. Here you can fuse 2 demons together and by doing so, you can create a stronger demon but it depends on the compatibility. If the demons are compatible, boom, you get a strong demon. If not, you're getting the damn tree again and this will be the case for a bit especially because you gotta be at a certain level to fuse demons. Everything else in this game is standard for a JRPG. You can come across areas where you can buy swords and armor, there are areas with a healing spring and a safe spot. Plus, in this version of the game, you can actually gamble, which is cool, I guess. But there's some annoyances to deal with, specifically in the damn areas you're going to be exploring. Okay, before we talk about the hell that is the dungeons of this game, I want to go and put something out there real quick. For the rest of the retrospect, I'm going to be talking about the dungeon design. In this case, I'm going to talk about all the dungeons because this game is only like 10 to 12 hours and it has 6 dungeons overall. Later games, I will be talking about the standout dungeons, no matter how good or bad they are. So, let's dive into this hellhole. <sighs> there are six major areas in the game that are interconnected within each other. The first place you start at is the 8th floor of Daedalus Tower in Mekon City, with the goal being to defeat the Minotaur on the first floor. Daedalus Tower overall is an introduction to the game's mechanics, with the 8th floor getting you used to the movement, speaking of which, the movement is very slow and stiff like you're walking through molasses or some shit. Now I hope you explore this floor before going down because if you go further without weapons or armor then yeah, you're fucked. The first few floors afterwards pretty much get you adjusted to the enemies and other mechanics and afterwards, boom, the game decides to fuck you in the ass with a spoon as the enemies get more powerful. Now the moment you reach Minotaur, you're only going to be doing like single digit damage. Now beforehand, you can come across Cerberus, who is great for this boss, and to be honest, only this boss. After being the Minotaur and exploring the last floor of Daedalus Tower, we enter Valhalla Corridor, and after helping the dude get his shield back, we have access to Sky City, which from this point on introduces an annoying stipulation to this game. For every area you go to, you have to find that dungeon special item. These items are important when it comes to beating the bosses, as all of the bosses are difficult to fight without it. When you seek out the item and use it against the boss, it becomes nothing but a slap fight, with every strategy being to use your best demons, use the party's best moves, and heal every other turn. Plus, you have to start finding some other items needed for a particular dungeon we'll talk about later. Anyway though, the goal for Sky City is that we gotta fight Medusa, who is slightly challenging but not too bad. The path to get to her is similar to Daedalus Tower being very linear. After defeating her, you get access to a safe area in the Sky City which lets you fuse demons, buy items, and gamble. Again, for some reason. But Sky City is also where you can travel to other dungeons through the Sky Captain, specifically to Mazurka Corridor and Infinity. But before we go there, we gotta go back to the Valhalla Corridor, which is the beginning of this game's bullshit dungeon design. Besides finding an item to make the Loki fight an absolute cakewalk, you gotta find some important items for both Izanami and the final fight against Lucifer. The first item we gotta get is Rick's Bracelet, which we can get after saving him and he turns into a demon and joins the party. Great. Later we meet this dude named Rax, who has two important items we need, but guess what? This bastard only wants Amethyst as a payment, and finding the Amethyst in Valhalla Corridor was a pain in the fucking ass. But after getting it, we managed to get the Magatama of Heaven and Ares Necklace. Now we can go find this dungeon's boss item, find Loki, and beat his ass. And Loki was easy as shit. Okay, so we're basically at the halfway point. But before we go and talk about going from Sky City to Mazurka, let me give you guys a quick lesson on game design, specifically in JRPGs. So listen, when you design a level or a dungeon, understand that you should never ever ramp up the enemy encounters to the point in which every step you take, you have to fight somebody and do not add these fuckers. Why you may ask? Let's go and find out. Okay, so here's the thing about Mazurka. This dungeon is the halfway point that decided for whatever reason to increase the enemy encounters and have almost every enemy give you status ailments. But the worst thing is introducing an enemy that can decrease your level. Now, I'm not talking about just for a battle or just, you know, I don't, you know, walk in it all, put some dirt on it, la di da di da. No, I mean permanently decrease your level. Plus, exploring this dungeon is horrible, navigating it is a pain in the ass, the item you need requires you to give this bastard all your money, and the boss item is actually required because Asatis is invisible, but once you run through her, she's also fucking easy. Shit, oh my god, you think at this point days would get a little easier, just a little easier? No, it just gets worse, so much worse, so, so much fucking worse, oh god. Fuck 
Hellfire. This dungeon is the epitome of bullshit. Wanna know why? Well, sit down. We got a lot to talk about. First of all, when you step foot into this dungeon, every step you take will make you lose damage, meaning your ass gonna be healing every time you take a step. Secondly, the enemies here are similar to the enemies of Mazurka, and yes, there's an enemy that can permanently decrease your level. God damn it. And finally, Izanami, who if you're not playing with a guide, you better fucking pray you don't fuck this up. If you do, you get booted all the way back to Daedalus Tower. And don't get me started on Persky's name and Roos's Bible. Also, set is easy as fuck if you get the most powerful sword in the game, the Hinokagasushi. I love this sword a lot. Now, something I didn't mention is that this game will either have you grind intentionally or not. Why? Don't fucking know, but let's just talk about the final dungeon, shall we? But we're finally at Infinity Palace, which all I'm gonna say is get the fucking White Dragon Gem, find this dude, talk to him, go back to Hellfire, get the gem, and come back. You'll hate yourself if you don't get it. Infinity Palace is big as shit, long as shit, and annoying as shit. Once you get to the final floor because of these fucking pitfalls. But afterwards, you get to the big man himself, Lucifer. You prepared for this. You have dealt with 10 to 12 hours of this hell. Now... What the f I hate this game. I hate this game a lot, even more than Final Fantasy 2. But let's just get on to the final dot, shall we? Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei is a game that has aged horribly. There are some okay parts, and understanding where the game got to start was cool, just like Legend of Zelda. But Jesus, this game has some archaic design that will definitely make your Georgia controller out the window. Running away from battles is like trying to run away from the IRS. The bosses are hit or mess with it mostly being a slap fight, and the process of finding the item for that boss to make it easier is annoying. But then again, there are some good stuff here. I like the variety of environments and the graphics of the Super Famicom that bring these areas to life. And also, it's not dark as shit anymore. I can see what's in front of me. I do feel like the Famicom though had better graphics for the shops you go to, and this also applies for the music, but in general, I'm just sick of hearing the battle theme. Alright, so, should you play the first Megami Tensei on the Famicom or Super Famicom? Hell no. And even if you say, you know what, I just want to play at least one area of it, just do that. Just do it. You'll be saving yourself a lot of trouble. Yet, if you still say, hey, fuck that, I still want to play this game, then at least play with a guide or a map. Because... Whew, especially if you need the part because, oh, you're going to hate it. With that, though, thank you guys so much for watching the video. Christmas is coming up soon, meaning that I'm going to be talking about a special little game that takes place in New York. It's not Home Alone, I, I promise you that. That'll probably be next year. But afterwards, we'll also be talking about Megami Tensei 2, a game that I've never played up until recently. So it should be interesting to see how this one goes. Hopefully it's not like Megami Tensei 1. But like always, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and make sure to stay safe and stay vibing, my guys.